Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and this is Life, Liberty, and Levin Saturday. Well, there's a lot to talk about here, and I do things differently here, for better or worse, and I'm very lucky. I have this platform, and the folks here allow me to do it. In fact, I don't believe they've ever interfered with anything I've done or said. It really is an expression of uh, free speech, and it is a fantastic opportunity, and I'm very grateful. Well, as you know, uh, we had this election in New Hampshire, and I think my friend David Brody summed it up best, and I'm going to tell you what he had to say, because to me it was the best analysis that I've heard. But then I want to put things in context, because the narrative we were hearing all night after this historic Trump victory was, but the moderates won't vote for him, but the independents won't vote for him, so he can't win. I was particularly hearing this from the left, a uh, liberal Democrat analysts, because they're, you know, they're looking to try and figure out how to get their man, Joe Biden, how to slip him back in the Oval Office without him actually having to say anything. So my man, David Brody, says more than half of primary voters were not Republicans. The electorate was more moderate and liberal this time compared to in 2016 by nine points. And we know why, because the Democrats had a concerted effort, as did Nikki Haley, to have independents who are actually Democrats dressed up as independents, not all, but many, to vote in the Republican primary. It's very sleazy. It's really a big, dirty trick. It's been going on forever. That's my point. It's a sleazy, big, dirty trick. It's the Republican primary. 64% of primary voters said they were not MAGA. MAGA. Biden hates. They're MAGA. MAGA. Let's see. Make America great again. Biden has a problem with that. Well, if you want to fundamentally transform America, I guess you do have a problem with that. Just 24% of primary voters were very conservative compared to 52% in Iowa. Nikki Haley had the endorsement of the popular governor of New Hampshire. Not so popular, Chris Sununu, anymore. Big loser. Nikki Haley spent tons of time there, and Nikki Haley had her two-person race on supposedly her type of political terrain, and it goes on. It was a historic vi victory for Trump. Uh, Republicans don't get over 50% of the vote particularly when only 47 percent of those voting are Republicans. Trump got 70 percent of the Republican vote. So if it had been an actual Republican primary, he would have gotten 70 percent and Haley 28 percent, a complete blowout. So he's won Iowa with a historic number that nobody else ever had, over 50 percent. He won New Hampshire with a historic number nobody ever had, despite all the attempts in Iowa and in New Hampshire by Haley, her supporters, the rhinos, the establishment, you know, the long list, the Democrats, the billionaires, to get Nikki Haley over the finish line. So she finishes third and second and basically declares victory. Nobody's buying that. We're not stupid. Third and second is not first. And I might add, I thought her speech was very unclassy. Let me put it that way. It lacked class. But why I'm here in this monologue to talk about, what I'm here to talk about, is this piece from 2016 of June 1 by a very liberal man, Frank Rich, who used to write for the New York Times, I don't know if he does or not, in New York Magazine. In fact, I didn't even know if he was still with us. Apparently he is. Hello, Frank. No fan of mine, apparently. But I want to read something to you. Because as I said at the opening of the program, the narrative now on Trump is, and you know, it's not a lot of thought that goes into media and some of this analysis, so they all repeat each other. Not all, but too many. And it is Trump can't win suburban women. Trump can't win moderates. He can't even win people within his own party. Look at the polls. Look at the numbers. Check this out. The greatest vote getter in Republican history is Ronald Reagan. Even in a three-man race, in 1980, he got a majority, 51 percent. Then, of course, in 1984, he almost got 60 percent, and he won 49 states. He almost won 50. Mondale State, if he had 1,500 more votes. Those are modern-day landslides, no matter how you count it. And he was a conservative. How did he do it? He reached out to these moderates and so forth. The same propaganda or wrong analysis or intentional effort to undermine Trump was used against Reagan. And that's the comparison I want to make. I don't agree with everything Frank Ritz says, because he's a leftist Democrat, but stick with me. 
So he writes in 2016, before the 2016 election, Trump gets the nomination. He says, to understand how Trump has advanced to where he is now and why he has been underestimated almost every step and why he has a shot at vanquishing Hillary Clinton, which he did, few roadmaps are more illuminating than Reagan's unlikely path to the White House. He says, in addition, I'm talking about Reagan, the candidate. Obviously, their personalities are different and there are other differences. But the nub, the core of this, is really, really very important to understand what's taking place. Reagan's and Trump's opposing styles belie their similarities of substance. Both have marketed the same brand of outrage to the same angry segments of the electorate. Again, forget about the cheap shots. Stick with me. Face the same jeering press. Yes. Attracted some of the same battlefront allies. Yes. Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, and the late, great Phyllis Schlafly. Offended the same elites, including two generations of Bushes. Outmaneuvered similar political adversaries and espoused the same conservative populism. Craig Shelley, the expert on the Reagan presidency, a longtime Republican political consultant and Republican acolyte and historian, has written authoritative books on the presidential campaigns of 1976 and 1980 that serve as correctives to the sentimental revisionist history that would have us believe that Reagan was cheered on as a conquering hero by GOP elites during his long climb to national power. To hear the right's triumphalism of recent years, you'd think that only smug Democrats were appalled by Reagan, while Republicans quickly recognized that their party, decimated by Richard Nixon and Watergate, had found its savior. I've said this over and over again, but it may ring even truer coming from a leftist. It rings absolutely true and shows you how so much of the analysis is way off. He says, grassroots Republicans whom Reagan had been courting for years with speeches, radio addresses, and opinion pieces beneath the mainstream media's radar were indeed in his camp. But aside from a lone operative, John Sears, Shirley wrote, the other major GOP players, especially Easterners and moderates, thought Reagan was a certified Yahoo. By his death in 2004, Shirley says they would profess their love and devotion to Reagan and claim they were there from the beginning in 1974, which is a load of horse manure. Even after his election in 1980, Shirley adds, Reagan was never much loved by his own party's leaders. If the GOP setbacks in the 1982 midterms, a Republican National Committee functionary taped a piece of paper to her door announcing the sign up for the 1984 Bush for President campaign. Shirley's memories are corroborated by reportage contemporaneous with Reagan's last two presidential runs. A poll in 1976 found that 90 percent of Republican state chairmen judged Reagan guilty of simplistic approaches with no depth in federal government administration, no experience in foreign affairs. It was a little different in January 1980 when a U.S. News and World Report survey of 475 national and state Republican chairmen found they preferred George H.W. Bush to Ronald Reagan. One state chairman presumably spoke for many when he told the magazine that Reagan's intellect was thinner than spit on a slate rock. As Rick Perlstein writes in The Invisible Bridge, what he says is the third and largest volume of his epic chronicle, The Rise of Conservative Movement, both Nixon and Ford dismissed Reagan as a lightweight. Barry Goldwater endorsed Ford over Reagan in 1976, despite the fact that Reagan's legendary speech on behalf of Goldwater's presidential election, you may recall this speech to a time for choosing, was the biggest boost that his so-called, he says, kamikaze candidacy received. Only a single Republican senator, Paul Laxalt of Nevada, signed on to Reagan's presidential quest from the start. Paul Laxalt was my political mentor. And I was involved in the 76 and 80 campaigns. This is exactly 100 percent correct. What put off Reagan's fellow Republicans will sound very familiar. He proposed an economic program, 30 percent tax cuts, increased military spending, a balanced budget, whose math was voodoo, according to George Bush, of course, and then some. He prided himself on not being part of the Washington establishment, mocked Capitol Hill's buddy system, and its collusion with the forces that have brought us our problems, the Congress, the bureaucracy, the lobbyists, big business, and big labor. Like Trump, but unlike most of his and Trump's political rivals, Reagan was accessible to the press and public. 
His spontaneity in give and takes with reporters and voters played well. Republican leaders blasted Reagan as a trigger-happy warmonger. So Reagan attacked Ford, the sitting Republican president he ran against in 1976 primary, and Henry Kissinger for what he said is their pursuit of bipartisan policies of detente and Chinese engagement. The sole benefit of detente, Reagan said, was to give America the right to sell Pepsi-Cola in Siberia. Pepsi-Cola in Siberia. For good measure, he stoked an international dispute by vowing to upend a treaty ceding American control over the Panama Canal. He said, we bought it, we paid for it, it's ours, and we're going to keep it. You can hear Donald Trump would have said the same exact thing. The Republican elites of Reagan's day were as blindsided by him as their counterparts had been by Trump. The Reagan came close to toppling the incumbent president at the contested Kansas City Convention in 76. The Ford forces didn't realize they could lose until the devil was at the door. A President Ford committee campaign statement had maintained that Reagan could not defeat any candidate the Democrats put up, listen to this, because his constituency is much too narrow, even within the Republican Party, and because he lacked the critical national and international experience that President Ford had gained through 25 years of public service. Ford dismissed him. They all dismissed him. And, of course, the press. Much of the press was slow to catch up to, he writes. A typical liberal establishment take on Reagan could be found in Harper's, which called him Ronald Duck, the candidate from Disneyland. That he had come to be deemed a serious candidate for president, the magazine intoned, was a shame and embarrassment for the country. Why am I telling you this? Because you're getting the same propaganda, the same false analysis with Trump. The power of that appeal was underestimated by his Democrat foes in 1980, even though Carter, too, had run as a populist and attracted some Wallace voters when beating Ford in 76. By the time he was up for re-election, Carter was an unpopular incumbent, ready, presiding over the Iranian hostage crisis, gas shortages, a reeling economy. Yet surely the Democrats would prevail over Ronald Duck anyway. Well, a strategic memo by Carter's pollster, Patrick Cadell, who became admirer of Reagan later, laid out the campaign against Reagan's obvious vulnerabilities with bullet points, quote, is Reagan safe, shoots from the hip, over his head, what are his solutions? But it was the strategy of Cadell's counterpart in the Reagan camp, the great pollster Richard Worthland, that carried the day with the electorate. He said voters wanted to follow some authority figure, he theorized, a leader who can take charge with authority, return a sense of discipline to our government, and manifest the willpower needed to get this country back on track. Or at least a leader from outside Washington like Reagan and now Trump, who projects that image, whether he has the ability to deliver it or not. And that's the final nail in the liberal moderate rhino coffin. Trump not only has the ability, he did. He already served for four years. We, the American people, are quite familiar with him. And we are quite familiar with the people who are trying to undermine him and stop him within the Republican Party and the press and in the Democrat Party. They're the same people. They're the same institutions. Even though they go on TV and say, I'm a Reagan Republican, Sununu, Christie, they were never near Reagan Republicans. They were never near Reagan. No, they're Ford, they're Bush, they are what they are. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.